spoiler alert arama hello everybody welcome to my shed world today i'm gonna answer your questions i've been gathering them i collect them whenever you ask questions if i'm not doing a q a i collect them so that i have them so i'm answering your questions um quite a few i think i go on for quite a while i apologize in advance if you're not in the mood for me but I hope you are. Um, so here we go, let's see. And ask me more questions, I want more questions. You know, later. Here we go. Would you like to be Gabe in real life? No. <laughs> like, I feel like I have met Gabe. Like, the beautiful psychopath thing is, you know, what are the thugs in high school? Like, the popular ones who are just complete dicks to everybody for no reason at all. Like, what is that? That is a real thing that I literally encountered, although, Many many more were the delightful people in high school. I, I was very lucky. I went to a very good high school where everybody was super nice and I have no regrets about it But there were always that few like I remember standing at the top of the stairs once in my high school This memory is so visceral even though it was 150 years ago and I was at the fringe of this group of quite popular people I was not popular. I was hanging aspirationally around them walking by and one of them just kicked him just hard enough almost to knock him down and then they all laughed at him because why? Like, it's not funny. And I just remember at the time just being like, oh, I don't, I no longer aspire to be part of your sick little world. And um, joined the band the next year because those were my people. I want to be the ones who are not part of that sick little cabal. But that kind of behavior, that violence for no reason against somebody who's smaller than you and vulnerable, I mean, that's Gabe, right? On a lesser scale. So yeah, I think I have met Gabe and he was a dick. Are you making another night school book? And the answer to that question is yes and no. So it depends on your definition of a night school book. Because number 10 is set in the night school world. And although the beginning, the first book, takes place at number 10 Downing Street and not at Samaria, there are characters in number 10 that if you've read night school you will recognize. But they're no longer young kids. They're not 16 anymore. They're now 22 or older if it's one of the adult characters. So you will see them, and they're just flashes, it's like Easter eggs. Um, but you will see more Night School characters in the later books in the series when there'll be much more crossover. So yeah, so the answer is kind of yes, but it's six and a half years later and everything's a little different and it is um, fascinating to write from that perspective. So yeah, so kind of yes, kind of no. Why did Sylvan leave at the end without a last conversation with Ali? So this question is about Endgame, and obviously, spoiler alert, Arama, if you haven't read it. But um, my perspective on that was about Sylvan's pride. And all the way through the series, the thing everybody kept bumping up against with Sylvan was his enormous ego. Like, he does have this huge ego, and it is both charming and funny, and it's what, what, what keeps him strong, is his faith in himself and his determination. Like, I was rereading um, Resistance. I'm rereading Resistance at Endgame for, to get myself ready to write number 10, book two. And there's this brilliant bit in it. And by brilliant, I don't mean like I'm brilliant, but I mean, it's just this little bit of character that I don't remember writing, where at the beginning, if you recall, he and Ali are at the beach in the south of France and they have to escape on his motorcycle. And he's incredibly, like, he goes incredibly fast and he takes enormous chances. And neither of them is wearing a helmet because there wasn't time to put one on. And they're both afraid. Well, she's afraid. He's not because he's Sylvan. And then they got into the safety and she's like, how did you learn how to do that? Like, that was really too fast. And she's like, she's really scared by it. And he just kind of leans against the motorcycle and says, well, my father, he forced, before he would let me, as a condition of giving me this motorcycle, he made me train with a motocross. Um, professional writer and that's where I learned and look it's so Sylvan like seconds later they were nearly killed and now he's just like bragging like I love that about him his pride I don't think he would stick around to shake Carter's hand and say you won and to watch the two of them together he just wouldn't and he wouldn't stick around to say more than he'd said already that last scene that they have together for me was his heartbreaking and was him losing for the first time in his life. And if you've never lost a thing you really wanted, when you do lose it, it's so shocking that you, you do kind of run out of words. I think Sylvan was devastated on a 
as much on, a, on an emotional level, but also on a pride level. His pride was really hurt. And I don't think he'd had any time to process that, but he was not going to stick around to watch them be happy. He just wasn't. And besides, his father needed him, his family needed him, and it was be very Sylvan. I mean, he had a private plane at his beck and call. He called it and he left. And I, th I always, I don't have any regrets about writing it that way. I think he would. This question, apropos of nothing, I love it. Have you ever been to Greece? I have been to Greece. <laughs> I was, when I was young and fancy free and footloose, I went backpacking around Europe. I was totally Euro trash, delightful Euro trash. I had no money, like no money. <laughs> I don't know how I did this. Three and a half weeks on an island in the middle of nowhere. And it would, I would have stayed longer, but it was incredibly cold. There was no food because all the restaurants shut down out of season and we had to go, but it was beautiful. And I loved it. I think about it all the time. I have to go back. I should go back. I need to go back. I've been watching this series set in Greece called The Trip. The Trip to Greece. It's a British series. And they're just driving around the most gorgeous countryside. And when I was there, because I was so poor, like I couldn't afford any of that. Like I could barely afford the boat to Greece and then later the boat out of Greece when I decided to go on to some place even like that was like I could afford even more time, which was like post-Soviet Prague. Um, so I couldn't do it, see the beauty beyond, like, so yeah. No, I've been, I liked it, I would go back. Can we have a Night School TV series update? So I can't say very much. However, if you subscribed to my, if you were part of my book group, my newsletter, I get, I get away with more in there because I don't think anybody in Hollywood would ever subscribe to it. So I do put the most information in my newsletter because I feel like nobody will see it except immediate family, friends, which is you guys. So subscribe if you haven't already, it's on my website, and then you'll get all the juicy info. But what I can say here for public consumption is that, you know, it takes forever. Um, it's going very well. Conversations are happening with the right people at the right places you would be happy with the companies that are thinking about, ha about being the place to host it. Um, but, then coronavirus happened and everything stopped. Literally nothing is getting made right now. Movies that were being produced right in the middle of massive expensive productions have stopped. Just stopped and everybody went home. So television series have stopped. Everything stopped. Nobody's, like it's just stopped everything. So everything was going incredibly well and then there was an apocalypse and now I don't know is pretty much the answer. So we wait. And you know, I sometimes think about Night School like in terms of the TV series, it is always bloody something. <laughs> and this time it is a mass worldwide epidemic. So hold tight, something will happen. I'm still optimistic in that pessimistic way of mine. So it's, it's moving along, or it was, now it's not moving along at all, nothing's moving. In the night school books, do you always agree with Ali's decisions? I would say the answer is absolutely no, absolutely not. And in fact, many times, when I was writing it, I had to step completely out of my own preference. I had to walk way back from what I would have done in those circumstances. And, and because it's based on her background, she's 16 years old, 17 years old in the first two books, so she has a birthday. And her life has been what it's been, you know, growing up in a happy family that then fell completely apart having a nuclear family with two parents who once were close to her and now are not. So she's going to make decisions based on that. I did not have that background. That's a very different background from mine. My family was never happy. We were never nuclear. We were a nuclear explosion family. We were a post-atomic family. So I had to set all of that aside, the things I would do, and try to put myself in her shoes. What would she do? She's got, based on her own life experiences, her own family, which has influenced her, the friends around her, and what she's trying to accomplish. Like, these are the things that fed into everything Ali did. So I think it's fair to say that she makes a lot of decisions I wouldn't make. And that is, in many ways, for me, the fun part. Do you have advice for young writers? I don't Do I have advice for young writers? My advice for young writers is always the same. And it is not maybe what you would expect. Because I think a lot of times people say, write, write all the time, write all your thoughts, write a diary. I will say, writing is fine. 
my advice instead is to read all the time. Read everything. Read other people's diaries. Read um, books you like, books you don't like. Read things that take you out of your normal comfort zone. Read books that people say are too old for you, but not the dirty ones, I just won't help. Read, um, like, and by that I mean read Shakespeare. Read um, A Man for All Seasons. Read um, <sighs> makeup guides from stars from the 50s. Read like, just go to libraries and look at sections you never look at. Go to the World War II section. Go to the history section if you wouldn't normally go there. Go avoid the auto repair section and the how-to section. That's, you know, crazy, crazy land. Um, but, but try different things. Try literary fiction. Try reading Wolf Hall. Maybe you'll like it. I didn't like it. Maybe you'll like it. Try, um, you know, try everything. That, that is how you find your voice by reading other people's voices and then seeing how you react to that, how that impacts your own um, mind and heart. And do you like it? Do you not like it? That's what I would say. Like, if you get in to the reading side of it, the writing side should happen almost automatically. Like, then your story can come from a place of having read a, a, so much that you, when your voice comes to you, when the idea comes to you, the voice is in there. Like it's already there, you just don't realize it. Because with every book you read, you're developing your own voice, your own feelings for how things should be, your own pace, your own approach. But I feel like when I read a book written by somebody who just at like 19 decided to write a book, I can tell how, what they haven't read. I can see that in their writing. And um, it's what you want is, the kind of like confidence and depth that comes from having read so much that there's nothing out there that you you feel like you wouldn't try if you see what I mean so read everything the writing will come when the writing comes don't feel like you have to be like writing your first novel at 19 although you're perfectly welcome to you know do it like publishers are completely open to that but I often find people's best books come a little later when they've read more. It's all about having that time to read. Will Nathaniel be in the number 10 series? Yes, very much so, but maybe not as you expect. Because I've always had this thing about how bad Nathaniel really was when at the very end, by the end, and who the bad guys really were. And some people have had the same, they've got it when they read it, like the nuance of Nathaniel. So get ready for Nathaniel when everybody's grown up and we see him slightly differently. Oh my God, I can't wait to write this. Anyway, yeah, so yes, yes, Nathaniel will be at number 10. Be ready to be surprised. Thank you so much for your questions and I wanna answer more and I will have plenty of time and we're just gonna just do videos constantly now. I think this particular video season may last for quite a while for as long as we're in quarantine. Like, I literally have nothing better to do. And I love talking to you guys. This is my escape. You are my joy. So keep asking me questions. I don't mind what they are, as long as they're nice <laughs> and encouraging. And, um, and let's like hang out in the comments because I love talking to you and just tell me things. Tell me what you're doing. How are you dealing with the apocalypse? How are things in your world? Are you able to find lettuce? Because finding lettuce is really hard for me right now. Anyway, take care, be safe. Keep breathing. See you in a week.